In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Steve. Well, God bless you this morning. It's good to see you. Hope you've had a great week. You know, we've been looking for the past couple Sundays about this issue of, of, of the new year and, and how we as believers in Jesus Christ want to commit to striving for something, right? We always should be striving for something, right, believers, brethren, sisters? And that is we want to become more godly. And it sound, that sounds like kind of a, a, a churchy Statement: I want to be more godly this year. But it's true. As believers in Jesus Christ, we, we all are in that process. We all are in a, a state of maturing. At least I hope we are. And if you're, a, you know, we're, we're never called to be stagnant, right? You know, stagnant is not a good thing. There was a church that was kind of stagnant in the book of Revelation and Jesus didn't have a lot of good things to say about that and we don't want to be like that we want to grow in our faith and so we've been talking about how we how we do that as believers and and it takes it takes work it, it takes uh, commitment and the theme passage I've, I've given to you is in first Timothy 4 7 where Paul says train yourselves to be godly train yourselves for godliness your version might say and I've given, I've just written out 10 things that will help us in that process of, of, of training and becoming. And, and the first one was, you know, write, for you to write out a purpose statement. I hope you've done that. You know, it just helps you to write things down, to articulate things on paper. Just, you know, why are you here? Why, why has God created you? For what purpose? And we talked about that. Then we talked about this issue of developing a time with God, a set time of Bible study and prayer, and, and just having that intimacy with Him each day and how important, important that is. And then we talked about this issue of, of th th this year I would know in a deeper way who I am in Christ and what I have in Christ as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and folks, this is another process, isn't it? As you, as you grow in your faith, as we all grow in our faith together, we, be, be, we become more aware of, of who we are, what Christ has made us to be. He's transformed us and is continuing to transform us, isn't he? He's making us like what? Like his blessed son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And what a... What a challenge that is in a world like this, isn't it? And then I challenge you to, you know, to, to, to start thinking about memorizing, not thinking about doing it, memorizing 12 scriptures this year. One a month. Uh, maybe, notice I didn't say verses, but I said scriptures, because sometimes it's really helpful to, to memorize a chunk of scripture. And you wouldn't believe how this will help you. And some of you have done this. Throughout the week, you know, where you're, you're living your life, you're at work or at school or whatever it may be, and, and you have the Word of God right there in your heart. You can, you can just quote back to God what He says is true. What a blessing that is. And then we talked about this issue of developing um, godly character qualities. And we all have those character qualities, right? Hopefully we're developing more in, a, uh, in ways of the fruit of the Spirit. And Paul talks about this issue of love and having joy and peace and patience and kindness. And we're developing in those areas. But in the, that process of developing those godly characters, we identify things that we really need to work on. Right? Yeah, maybe it's, maybe it's your language. Maybe it's your temper. Maybe it's, I don't know, maybe it's your thought life. Maybe it's what you... Watch on TV. I, I don't know. This isn't a legalistic thing. These are just things that help us to grow in our faith in Jesus Christ. And the seventh thing we talked about is the value of attending a small group of some kind. Because people, believe it or not, we need each other. Amen. We really do. I, I need you. 
And you need me. And the, and the best way we can do that is to just get together in homes or whatever it is. A, a small group of people can just be real with each other. Because sometimes, let's be honest, it's not that easy to be real at church. Because we're conditioned sometimes, aren't we? How you doing, Pastor? Oh, I'm just doing great. My guts just kill. You know, I don't want to expose any weakness. I want you to think that I'm, oh, you know, Superman. And I, you want to think that you're Superman, Superwoman, whatever it is. But really, deep down, you may be, may be just going through a real, real hard time. But you're not allowing anybody to share that with you. And walk through that with you. And folks, we need each other. We need each other to grow. I love meeting with brothers and sisters that challenge me in my faith. I'll say something. Well, what do you mean by that, Tim? Well, you know, we give those churchy answers sometimes. Well, what does that mean? Well, hmm, let me think about that. You know, I challenge you to really think things through, to know what we believe and why we believe it. And so valuable to be with, be with one another. There's something about that, that koinonia, that, that intimacy that we have in Christ. And I want to pick it up. Well, I want to try to get through the last three this morning. Uh, and if you've got your sheet or you forgot your sheet, I think there's a, there's a little bit of a, a breakdown outline in your bulletin so you can kind of look at that. The, the, the eighth thing, the number eight, is, is learn how to share your faith. And this isn't an easy one either, is it? You know, learn how to, how to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Somebody comes to me and says, Pastor, that's your job. Well, I, yeah, it's my job to know how to share the gospel, but it's your job too, right? When's the last time, when's the last time you've be, been able to articulate your faith to someone else? You know, you've just been able to sit down. I'm going to be flying out of, uh, out of Lin or Bellingham in a couple of weeks. And, and, and I look forward to that because I, I, I've developed kind of a habit, commitment. You might say that whenever I get on the, a plane, I like to share with the person on my right and my left. So whoever, gets, whoever sits with me is going to hear something about the gospel. And one of the questions I, I in, in conversation, I always try to get to strike, I strike up a conversation. Sometimes people on flights, they don't want to talk, right? They got the, they've just put the headphones on and, and if they do that, I tap them on the shoulder. <laughs> really get them going, you know, what does he want, you know? And I just introduce myself, you know, and we get talking and, and usually when you break the ice, somebody starts talking with you, right? And so one of the questions I, I like to, you know, they always say, well, what do you do? Well, I'm a, I, I'm a pastor. Either they go, what? or they, oh, you are, what is that, you know? And, but usually they, they're interested and they talk about, well, what's it like being a pastor? And all? But one of the questions I always interject, it's somewhere in the conversation, well, what about you? Do you believe in heaven? And I tell you, most of the time, I would say probably 98% of the time, I've had everybody say, yes, I do. And then the next question I ask them is, well, well how do you plan on getting there? How do you plan on getting there? Well, you know, I'm a pretty good guy, or I go to church, or I've been baptized. You know, I hear all kinds of stuff. Honestly, I've, uh, I've never heard a plan on getting to heaven through the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And so it gives me opportunity to share. Well, let me tell you what the Bible says. It's not what I say that's important. It's what, what God has said that, that's really important. And so that gives me an gives me a opportunity. Folks, we have opportunities all around us, don't we? You know, but sometimes we just, we just want to, we don't want to say anything. Because we think, why well, somebody might reject me or somebody might, uh, you know, feel bad about me. Or, or somebody might ask me a question that I can't answer. I've had people ask me questions that I can't answer. Because we don't have all the answers. But we can say, well, you know, that's a good question. Give me your phone number and I'll get back to you on that. They never give me their phone number. But <laughs> anyway, learn how to share your faith. You know, Peter said in 1 Peter 3.15, he said, but in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. I think that's, he says that in actually verse 14. But then he says, he says, always be prepared. Always be prepared to give an answer to those who come to you and ask you for the reason, for the hope that you have. 
But he says, but do this with gentleness and respect. Gentleness and respect. That's why I, little, I get a little frustrated. I'm not going to throw stones at it, but I do get a little frustrated when, I, when the street, pre, uh, street preachers, if you've ever been confronted with a street preacher, and they're telling, you're going to hell, you're, you're, and they're pointing that finger at you, and they're screaming, I thought, gentleness, man, respect, you know? And uh, so I think that, that we need to have an attitude of Christ there. That, that, that Christ was gentle. He was gentle in spirit. And when he spoke, he, he spoke in a way that was very, very authoritative because he was the Son of God. But yet it was a way that was, it was, it was a, a gentle, even a gentle rebuke because <laughs> he did rebuke. Boy, did he ever with the Pharisees. Right? But, but we need to be prepared. If someone came to you today and said, Hey, hey, so, hey, Joe, hey, Sally, could you, could you tell me about Jesus? What would you say? Now, I love that, I love that passage in, in, in John 9. John, the gospel. He says, Jesus, remember when he heals the blind man? In fact, if you have a Bible, you might just flip over there. He heals the blind man, and it, it, the whole chapter's on this, you know. He's, and and he's, been he's been blind since birth, right? And so people knew him as a blind beggar. And uh, we don't know how old he was. He was probably, you know, in his early 20s, somewhere around there. And, uh, and Jesus comes along, and, and Jesus responds to this guy. And, and he does something really weird. He spits on the ground. Remember, he makes some mud and he spits in his eyes and he says, go wash in the, in the, in the uh, lake of Siloam. And the guy does that and he comes out. He can see. And, and he, would you be excited? I mean, this guy's excited. And I'm sure he's saying, man, look, look at me. I can see again. This guy over here, he, 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 he healed me. And the Pharisees hear about this. And, you know, they're a little concerned because Jesus is gaining such popularity. And people are starting to follow this, this miracle, miracle worker. And the things that he's saying are just absolutely profound. And the Pharisees don't like this because, you know, they're the main religious sect of the, of the day. And they've got all the answers. And Jesus, boy, they, he... He's doing some things and saying some things that really, really creates some havoc. But they, they started interacting with this blind guy, right? And who, who healed you? And they're just really kind of coming down on him. You see this guy, what's he saying? Uh, well, you know, I, this Jesus guy, you know, I, I don't know much about him, but I do know this. I was blind, but now I can see. That's all he said. I was blind, but now I can see. So I tell people, you know, tell people what Jesus has done for you, Christian. What has Jesus done for you? Well, you were blind, and now you can see. Because if you can't see, what? You're still blind. <laughs> But you, God has opened your eyes to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you've seen Jesus. And tell them about that. Tell them how, how, how you know, I, I hear this sometimes. Well, you know, I, my testimony isn't really all that big a deal. I didn't have any dramatic experience. You know, I quit drinking or an alcoholic or drugs, and then I came to Christ. And a lot of people don't have that experience. They just kind of were, they're born in a Christian home, and they just kind of moved into Christianity. And so if you were to ask them, when was that day and that hour that you became a Christian, you trusted Jesus Christ as Lord? And you think, I can't really remember. And they get, some people get nervous about that. And I said, that's not the issue, man. Where are you right now? Are you, is Jesus Christ your Savior and your Lord and your Master and King? Absolutely. Well, don't worry about the past issue. The issue is today. That's why Paul would say, examine yourselves today, whether you're a Christian. Don't, don't go back to tomorrow. Where are you at now? And so you can say to that person that it comes to you and asks you, well, what has Jesus Christ done in your life? What has he done in your life? Well, past tense, remember the past tense of justification? You can say, hey, you know what? Jesus Christ has set me free from the penalty of my sins. 
boom, open door to share the gospel. And you can say, today, right now, Jesus Christ is saving me from the power of sin in my life. I don't have to give in to these things that I used to give in to. I don't have to be held in bondage to the things that I was once in bondage with. I've been set free, and I'm continuing to have victory in my life over the power of sin. And then you can share your hope. Hey, and you know what? There's coming a day that Jesus Christ will... Set me free from the very presence of sin. It's a place the Bible describes as, as heaven. There's going to be a new earth and a new heaven, a new Jerusalem. And everything's going to be new. And that's going to be for me that, that Christ is gone. He's, he's preparing a place for me and for you and for all believers in Christ. You ever wonder what that place is going to be like? You ever wonder that? Just contemplate heaven. I mean, if he created all this that we see in six days, and he said it about 2,000 years ago that he's going to prepare a place, and he's had 2,000 of our years to do that, oh, folks, we are going to be in awe. We've got such a hope in Jesus Christ. The blind man said, I was blind, but now I see. Mark 5 is another one that I, I've always thought was so interesting. The, the, the man that Jesus heals that was demon-possessed, and, and Jesus heals this man. And remember, after he was healed, I mean, he, he was touched by God himself. And Jesus, this man, he's begging Jesus, I want to I I go with you. Can I follow you? Can I go? And Jesus didn't let him. And you know what he says? Jesus said this, he says, no, I want you to go home and I want you to tell your family how much the Lord has done for you and how he has, has had mercy on you. So the man went away and he began to tell all those in Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. I love that. Jesus knew that this man was going to be more effective going home and telling people, his family, his friends, what he had done. More effective doing that than it would following him. Doesn't that sound strange? But in doing that, he's still really, he's following Jesus. Because he obeyed Jesus, didn't he? And I love that where it says, and the people were amazed. They were in wonder. They're looking at this guy and going, I can't believe what he's saying. I, I can't believe what he's doing. I, he's... You know, people will be amazed at your testimony, no matter what it is. Because your testimony is going to have some basic truths in it that, that align with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when they hear it, and the Lord's moving in their life, they're going to be, oh, have you ever done that? You share with somebody, and, and all of a sudden you see the light go on in their mind, and it's like, oh, I get it now. There's an illumination thing going on. And they see Jesus. They understand the gospel. Probably one of the most exciting things in life for me is to see someone ignited by the Spirit of God with illumination. It is a, it is a marvelous, marvelous thing. So do you know the gospel? Do you know the gospel well enough that you can articulate the gospel? You, you better, because this is, church is what? Good news fellowship. That's what we're about, right? What's the good news? Well, the good news is that God has saved me from the bad news. <laughs> because it's bad news, right? The gospel of Jesus Christ. Number nine, let's move on here. Or I'll, I could be here all morning on that one. But the, the, the number nine is find a place of ministry where you can serve the Lord based on your spiritual gifts. You know, you've heard me say this. I'm sure you've heard every pastor say this, that you know what? Every believer in Jesus Christ is called to be a minister. That it's not just the clergy. Not just the pastor, not just the elders, but it's every member minister. We were having a discovery class this morning with four dear people, and I was, we were talking about that, that, that this church views every believer as, as ministers, that we're all called based on our gifts to, to minister. In what way? Well, we know from Ephesians 4 that we're called to build each other up. 
And that's the responsibility of pastors and evangelists and teachers that to build up the body of Christ so that they may be a, come to that place of, of, of faith where, we're, where, we're, where we look so much like Jesus, not only individually, but corporately. What does that look like? What does a church look like that really looks like Jesus? Looks like you. People that care for each other. Do you know what your gift is, Christian? Do you know what your spiritual gift is? You know, God has, God has given you a gift. For what purpose? To keep it for yourself? No. To give it away. I used the illustration this morning about, can you imagine Christmas time, you get, a, you know, you give a gift to somebody, like one of your kids or something, and you're so excited about it because, oh, it's the neatest gift, it's it. and you give it to them, and they kind of look at it and go, eh. Kind of hurts, doesn't it? I wonder how God feels when he gives gifts to his people, and we kind of, eh. God has gifted every single believer with one or more gifts for the purpose of glorifying Him through the equipping of each other, helping each other grow together. 1 Peter 4.10, Peter says it, he says, each of you should use whatever gift he has received to serve others. To serve others. Each of you should use whatever gift. That means we've all been given a gift to serve others. Do you know what your gift is, Christian? I ask you again. You know, some of you, I know, have the gift of, I can just kind of go, you've got, you've got, some of you have the gift of serving. Some of you have the gift of helps. Some of you have the gift of teaching. Some of you have, have gifts that God has given to you, not some, all of you if you're a believer, for the building up of the body of Christ. Talk, Paul talks about it in Ephesians, Ephesians 12. You know, Paul gives us, Ephesians 4. Paul gives us, in 1 Corinthians 12, he gives us a, a list of a bunch of gifts. And, and I don't think they're exhaustive. I, I think there are, there are other gifts that God has given to the church. But Paul just lays out some of them that he has placed in his word. And they're for the equipping. They're for the giving away. Helping one another grow in Christ. Some of you have the gift of mercy. You, you, you sympathize with other people that are going through a hard time. Ah, that's a great gift to have. Great gift to have. I love to take people with me on visitation, especially hospitals that have the gift of mercy. Yeah. Sometimes when I take somebody with the gift of teaching, they want to tell everything to the person that's sick. Well, this is why this has happened to you. Let me give you three reasons. Boom, 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 you know. And, 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 and you know, it's kind of hard. It can be used by God. But, you know, I, if somebody with a gift of mercy, man, I want to know who that person is. Because I want to hang out with them. They're sympathetic with other people. Some of you have the gift of encouragement. Here's one of the problems with gifts, folks. We can say, uh, you know, I'm not going to really do that because it's not my gift. I really don't have to encourage this guy because it's not my gift. Or uh, I don't really have to, uh, uh, to serve because it's not my gift. Wrong. <laughs> we are all called, all of us at some level, we're all called to serve. We're all called to help each other out. We're all called to, to minister, to encourage each other. Some of you may be really lousy at encouragement. You know, maybe it's something really hard. You just don't like to encourage. You like to pick out the things that are wrong and, and bring somebody down. Tell me, you know what? You, know, you, just, you need to change that. You really do. Based on the Word of God. You need to be a person that desires to build someone up rather than tear them down. It's one of the things at church that really caused me to bleh. People that like to rip on each other, whether it's gossip, whether it's you know, picking out all the things that somebody's doing wrong, or why can't you pick out the things that somebody's doing right and build them up rather than, you know, you just, and the person just, don't be that way. I remember I had this guy, every time I got done with a 
a sermon, and I'm, an, I'm a cr enough of a critic to myself. You know, I don't need anybody to bring me down. I bring my, but I, every Sunday, man, pastor, if you didn't say this, you should have said this, you should have done it this way. You, you didn't need to say that. And I just, you know, just wanted to give him a real gift of encouragement. <laughs> but that, that gets old, doesn't it? Tell me something good, man. Husband, when's the last time you've sat down with your wife and said, Honey, you are the best thing that God has ever given to me next to my salvation. You are a gift from God. Thank you for, thank you for being the mother to my children, our children. And he just blessed your wife with words of encouragement. I don't know if you've ever seen that book called The Languages of Love. Yeah? There's so many ways we can express love. I think, I think somebody picked five of them. You know, you, you, you do things for somebody, and that's, that's the way somebody really feels like they've been loved. You know, you're, I think it's, there's some truth to this. You know, your love language may be encouragement, or your love language might be something somebody does for you, things done for, or, or, or your love language, you know, might be time spent with. You know, those kinds of things. Uh, help me with another one. There's, I think there's five of them. There's words. There's gifts. Ah, there's touch. You know, and we all respond in different ways. Some people that don't have a, the words, the encouragement thing is their gift. You know, you can encourage them, encourage them, and say words, words, words. And they look at you and say, yeah, right, like my wife. <laughs> Honey, you're the best thing in the world. Yeah, go mow the lawn. <laughs> <laughs> And that's your language. I mow the lawn. Oh, honey, you love me. And, and so and some of us have, it's a touch thing. Some people are real, real huggy. Other people don't hug me, you know. It's a, it's a, and we need, it's, it's part of the journey together as a body. It's part of the journey as a husband and wife, your children. It's a great thing to do with your children. To, to say, God, what are their languages of love? And help me, help me to do that. A lot of guys, most guys I find, not all, but most. It's just words. Just tell me I'm okay. That's all I need. <laughs> right? Uh, folks, we are called. We are called to minister to one another. Let's do it. Let's continue to do it. Let's do it better this year. Let's do it better. The last point I want to bring out is to become a better steward of the resources God has entrusted to you. You know, there are, there are different ways we, we are stewards as Christians, right? We, we, we give our time. We give our gifts. We, we, give, we give things. But, you know, God has specifically called us to a thing that we really have a hard time giving. And that's oftentimes, it's the, it's the money thing, right? Now, some of you are thinking, oh, great. He's going to ask for money. I know he is. <laughs> now, I'm just going to tell you what the Word says about it. Because it is a kind of a, a sticky thing. You know, the word tithe, the 10% the thing really is, if, if you're really honest with Scripture, it's an Old Testament uh, principle. It's, it's, it's under the Old Covenant. It's when, the, you know, the, the people of Israel, God required them to bring about the support for the, for the covenant ministries of the Old Testament, the temple, that, that they were to give 10% of all that they had. And the Israelites were required to do this. And in doing this, they would receive a blessing. And usually the blessing in the Old Testament, was, it was a material, physical kind of a blessing, whether it would be land or children or whatever. But in the New Testament, you'll find, you won't find the tithe thing as much as you do in the Old. Now, Jesus didn't condemn tithing. Remember? I mean, the Pharisees often brought their tithe that was a thing that they would do, and they would make a big show of it. And Jesus didn't like that. Because what's he all about? He's about the heart, isn't he? He's not so much about the external as he is the internal. And so he sees all this stuff going on, and he comes down on them for that. Not for tithing, but for the condition of their heart in tithing. I, I love that little story about, remember the widow? And he, he's observing all these Pharisees coming with their tithes. And here comes this little widow and she gives two copper coins. And Jesus says to his disciples, he says, that woman, she really gave. Why? Because she gave out of her poverty. But she gave. 
And folks, I think there's something there that we need to understand as a church. It's something that's lost in our days at some level. There's a, a generation, it seems, of believers that really don't understand this issue of the commitment of, of giving in the church. And just because it's an Old Testament principle, tithing, doesn't mean it's not a good thing in the New Testament. If you choose, a, you know what, I'm going to give 10% of everything that I make to the church for the ministries of the church and to help out with the church, that's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, the Bible says in the New Testament and the Old, but he really lays this out in the New Testament, that everything that we have, folks, everything we have belongs to him. That I own nothing. Not even my own life. The Bible says in, I think it's 1 Corinthians 6, that, that we are the temples of God. And that we have been bought with a price. That we've been purchased. What? Through the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we need to realize that. That, you know, everything that I have is from God. And I need to honor God with stewardship. Uh, and boy, it's a, it's a good thing. It's a good habit to get into. To, to give to the local church for the building up of the body and, and, the, and the ministries. Remember what Jesus said, in the, or God said in the Old Testament, in Haggai chapter 2, verse 8, he said, Silver is mine and gold is mine. In other words, it all, the, all the wealth, it's, it's his. I mean, if he's got streets of gold in heaven waiting for us, it's not going to really be a big deal up there. But here it is. And, and I, think, I think so many people, even believers, are so bound to this thing called money. Right? And it becomes a controlling factor in our life. Money, money, i got to make money. There's nothing wrong with making money. But the question is, how do we view money? How do, we, how, how do we view wealth? Do we view it as a, a blessing that God has allowed me to have so that I can give back and build up the kingdom of God? Or is it viewed, man, this is going to give me all the toys that I want, man. I can get the big house, the new car, and all this stuff. And I'm not, and I'm not going to say that that's always bad. But if it's controlling me, then it's bad. And it's easy to control, isn't it? I, I think that's why, uh, because I really do, I think that's why the Bible speaks so much about money. You know, 800 times the Bible speaks of money. And of all Jesus' parables, half of them speak about money. Why? Because of this issue. It controls us. Now, if I give, does that mean God blesses all the time? You know what? I believe it is. But I don't think it's the same kind of blessing that we see in the Old Testament that's always physical and material. I believe that God blesses in ways in maturity and in the heart. And He blesses us in ways that we see Him in greater ways. And we're allowed to, to know Him better. When we are obedient, when we are obedient as believers, there will be blessing at some level from God. Expect it. Obedience equals blessing. And it's a good thing. I like the, uh, in the Old Testament too, Malachi, it's, the, 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 it's often heard in, in messages of giving where, where it says here, it says, bring, in Malachi 3.10, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test, God says. I will, will I not open the, the, the windows of heaven for you and pour down a blessing until you need no more? That's pretty cool. God, I'm going I'm to give and you're going to bless, but I'm not giving just for that blessing. I'm giving because you desire that from me. You want me to express my love to you in a way that I give my life away. Because there's many different ways to, to give. Resources, yeah. Um, talents, yeah. Gifts, yeah. We're to give our lives away. And that's hard to do in a very selfish society like ours, folks. It's very difficult to do. Um, so 
So I challenge you this year that you would go before the Lord and say, God, is there, is, do you want me to increase my giving? If you're giving, praise God for it and thank you so much for honoring God with your wealth. If you're not giving, I challenge you. Put God to the test. Watch Him bless. Watch Him open the door for you and your relationship with Him in ways that you know it's not. I, I, I love that. To think that as believers in Christ, we are on a journey in this life. We're getting to know Him, right? He, he's, he's showing us things about who He is. And, and if you really desire that this year, He is not ever going to turn you away. Ever, ever, ever. Remember what God said in Jeremiah? He said, you will find me. You will find me when you seek me with all your heart. He's talking to the Hebrew people. When you seek me with all your heart, you will be found. I will be found by you. So my question, folks, are we seeking God corporately as a church? I hope we are. I hope that's our, our passion is to know him more and more as a corporate body, but also individually, that you as a believer would wake up every morning and say, God, I want to know you better today. I want to seek you with all my heart. God will begin to open up the windows of heaven and show you things that you know it's not about him. And you will be in awe. Be in awe. Let's pray together. Father, you are so good to us. Lord, you've given us everything we need. You've given us life. You've given most all of us homes and cars to drive and food on the table. You've given us shelter. You've given us, God, you've given us so much. And Lord, we would ask that you would forgive us for times when we just take all this for granted. But Lord, really, they all come from your gracious hand. And we don't deserve anything from you. But Lord, we would thank you today again and praise you for your grace and for your mercy that's all found in Christ. That he really is the storehouse of heaven. That all the beauties and treasures of everything in life and heaven, they all are in your son, Jesus Christ. He is the ultimate treasure. So, Father, help us this year to be a people that would, that would strive for godliness. That would discipline ourselves. That, that some of these things that we've heard and... That we, would, that we really commit, God, to you this year in a, in a greater way, in a deeper way. Father, may it be our heart's desire to know you, to search for you, to grow in Christ. May that be a reality. And we'll always thank you and praise you, God, because this is your work. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen.